Well, hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. I want to talk to you about three mistakes we want to avoid when we're defending truth. Uh, okay, sounds kind of like we're full of ourselves, doesn't it? Ooh, defending truth. Does God really need you and me to defend his truth? No. He can speak for himself. I mean, he has a voice. He can use it audibly if he wishes to. Also, he's got angels, his messengers. They do a terrific job, do a lot better job than we do, in my opinion. Not, not my opinion. They absolutely do. So does God need you and me uh, to be defending truth? No. Does God call you and I to defend truth? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he does. First Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready to give an answer. The word for that is apologia, from which we get our word apologetics. That means a reasoned defense, a reasoned defense. Hey, if that's God's calling, if God is saying, for my purposes, by my design, I commission you, my followers, members of the body of Christ, my disciples, I commission you to be both articulators of truth and defenders of truth, apologists. We don't get to say, oh, well, that's too audacious. Who am I to do that? That's Moses saying, to God, oh, I'm not really a public speaker. Go find somebody else. No, you don't get to do that because the vessel doesn't get to say to the potter, I'll tell you what you should be fashioning here. The potter says to the vessel, this is what I want you to be. This is what you will be. What does that say to us? We're stewards of truth. The uh, early Christians knew that, didn't they? You look at the book of Acts, why they studied the word, didn't they? They continued daily in, in doctrine and in prayer. They preached the word and they defended the word. They studied the word, certainly. They preached the word and they reasoned with people to defend the word. They defended truth. They spoke. They gave a reasoned defense for the beliefs that they have. And that put them at odds with much of the wisdom of their time. They were walking a different course. I remember a movie uh, from my junior high school days called uh, Up the Down Staircase, in which a teacher had been hired, and she kept walking up the staircase in which people were supposed to walk down. And she would be asked, why are you walking this way? You're going this way. Everybody else is going that way. What is the problem with you? Now, Paul told the Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 2, in times past, you walked according to the course or the way of this world. That's where the flow of traffic was. That's where you were going. But what are you doing now? You're going up the down staircase. You're going a different way. You're going against the tide. And that's going to raise some eyebrows. Not because you're necessarily even saying anything. I mean, you, you may have experienced this on the job. When people start asking you, why don't you get drunk with us? Why won't you join in the office gossip? Why won't you go to the strip club with us? And people are going to ask, why do you walk this way? Why are you walking a different way than the rest of us? And you know what? That's a great opportunity. A lot of people are wringing their hands over the, you know, the corruption of the times. Well, so am I. I mean, I hate such a high percentage of what I hear these days every time I look at the news. I really do. But, hey, what we're seeing is manifestation. I mean, we are seeing a brazen manifestation of the evil and the violence and the general corruption, which has always been there, but it's been restrained. I think part of that has to do with the effectiveness of the church. My honest opinion, can't prove it, but I believe it, is that as the church has lost vibrancy and influence, we have been less of a restraining force in the culture. And simultaneously, God in his wisdom is, I believe, alerting the church to the fact that you're, you're right at the end of the race here, guys. And so there's a manifestation of what is really underneath all the veneer of a civilized culture. That's manifestation. You know what? Manifestation is opportunity. Manifestation is opportunity. So, yeah, there's a chance to defend the truth when the world now is manifestly opposed to so much biblical truth about so many things, right? Life within the womb, the definition of justice, the definition of salvation and Christianity, the definition of marriage and sexuality. Wow, so much opposition. We are walking a different way, and people are saying, why? Why do you walk that way? Thank you for asking. There's an opportunity. Let's have a reasoned dialogue about truth. I want to offer my apology of my defense. Go for it. Great opportunity. And side note, but we really need lay people to take up that challenge. The, the apologist is not just meant to be the PhD, you know, the, the Sean McDowell's and the Alex McFarland's and all the brilliant people out there. No, that's good for them. But 
that's like saying only Greg Laurie should evangelize. No, we should all be witnesses to the truth. We should all be sharing the gospel. And then you have those who are called to do it full time. Hey, that's awesome too, but let's let's not shy away from it, okay? So yeah, go for it. Let's talk about three mistakes to avoid, though, while you're going for it. And that means observing our ABCs, observing our ABCs. First, A, accuracy, accuracy. Keep accuracy in mind. That is to say, avoid the error of compromising facts for the sake of truth. Avoid the error of compromising facts for the sake of truth. Now, just for an example, when I was a kid, mid-60s, uh, when I was about 12, 13, uh, Drugs were starting to become more and more in vogue. A lot of kids were turning to drugs. Unfortunately, I did as well. One of the worst mistakes I've made, and I've made a lot of them. But the point is, there was a lot of talk about marijuana, as people were also taking LSD and, and methadrine and, and um, hashish and all sorts of other, uh, other drugs. Um, so in the interest of keeping people from smoking marijuana, I can still remember some of the films that our schools would show us, and it would show somebody take a little bit of a marijuana cigarette, and all of a sudden they would become the wolf man and get really crazy and violent and wacko. And the next thing you knew, they're shooting heroin just immediately after they smoked pot. So what, what was basically happening? Um, the truth was, yes, they were right in saying smoking marijuana is wrong, and it is. There's, there's no reason to be altering your mind. That's a form of witchcraft, really, a pharmacia. So I think they were absolutely speaking the truth. Don't do this. It's wrong. But they, they were actually um, perverting the facts when they said, if you smoke marijuana, next thing you know, you're going to be doing heroin. No, that's not true. If you smoke marijuana, you're going to turn into the werewolf. No, that's not true. That's not true. Those are not facts. Okay. Um, when people, oh, to this day, but certainly in the 80s and 90s, when a lot of people talked about uh, homosexual people, lesbians and gays. Uh, the truth they were telling, this is not God's will. That's right. It's not God's will. God did not design us for that. We can see that in anatomy. We can see that in temperament. Most important, we see it in the word of God, what God intended. That's, that's true. That was not what God intended. But the fact is not all gays and lesbians are promiscuous. Not all of them are dangerous. Not all of them are communist. And yet so many people speaking about homosexuality compromised facts and said homosexuality is wrong. Why? Because those gay people, they sleep with 500 people a week. And they're all dirty, disease-ridden communists. They're all dangerous, and they're going to molest your children. Those are not facts. It's completely wrong. I mean, it's not wrong. Are, are there some terrible lesbians and gays? Of course there are. But, but you'd never want to say that just because somebody is committing a particular type of sin, everything else about their character is lethal, because that simply isn't true. That was another case where a lot of believers compromised facts for the sake of truth. Um. And, and the fact, even uh, when we talk about salvation, I mean, when I was in my early years as a Christian, I was witnessing to everything that breathed, <laughs> and uh, I was guilty of this. I mean, the truth was people apart from Christ are lost. That's always been true, always will be true, absolutely. So I was right in saying you're lost without Christ. But I was also saying as fact something was not that was not a fact when I said, and I know how unhappy you must be as a non-Christian. A non-Christian cannot be happy. A non-Christian is miserable. You're empty. You just don't know it. You're hungry for more, but you just don't know it. You know, you're an unhappy person. Well, that wasn't a fact. That was stupid. It was arrogant. It was ill-informed. Plenty of non-believers are very happy people. Well, they're, they're lost. They're dead in sin. They're not alive in Christ. I'd rather be saved and unhappy than unsaved and happy. But the fact is, it's very presumptuous. And very uh, ill-informed to go around saying, oh, if somebody's not a Christian, well, they're unhappy, obviously. No, that's not true. That's not true. Don't compromise facts for the sake of truth. Now, this goes for statistics as well. A lot of people, when they enter into debate about different social issues, they rely on statistics. Anything wrong with that? Of course not. I, I'm interested in statistics. I really think statistics tell us more about what is than about what should be. So statistics may say the majority of people do this. That doesn't mean this is the right thing to do. It just tells us what the statistics say about this, whatever it may be. But if you're going to use stats to back a point, and I've done that myself sometimes, and you know nothing wrong with it, just be sure your quote is accurate, okay? Don't quote non-existent statistics. Don't misquote statistics. 
Don't say somebody said 10% when in fact they said 2%, okay? Be sure your quote is accurate and be sure your quote is verifiable. It really isn't fair to say, and a study out of Princeton University said this, this, and this, and then you don't tell people where they can find that study. Well, that's they can't verify it either way. So you know, be sure your quotes are accurate. Be sure that your quotes are verifiable. And if you're going to use anecdotes to back your point, that's okay. But try to avoid generalizations that won't apply to everyone, okay? I mean, so oftentimes somebody will hear a testimony of someone who's overcome a particular type of sin, and they'll hear the person say, and everybody who commits this sin does exactly the same thing I did. I used to use drugs, and I was miserable and violent, and I robbed banks to support my habit. And that's what they all do, you know. Well, no, they don't. They don't. So be sure to avoid generalization. So, okay, observe the A of the ABCs. Keep it accurate. Secondly, B, keep it biblical. Keep it biblical. Avoid the air, it's a two-fold air, of neglecting biblical priority and biblical rationale. If you're going to defend the faith, great. But do it in a way in which you do not neglect biblical priority or biblical rationale. Let me talk about both. First, there's biblical priority. That means keeping the main thing, the main thing, from a biblical viewpoint, from a biblical viewpoint. Okay, a person without Christ happens to also be homosexual. It's true that without Christ, they're dead. It's true that homosexuality is a sin. What is the priority issue? They're without Christ. Now, that's the priority issue. Okay, I'm a, I'm a product of the Jesus movement, early 1970s, Calvary Chapel, uh, the Maranatha music explosion. My first pastor was Pastor Chuck Smith. I will go to my grave or to the rapture, blessing the name of Chuck Smith for the grounding of the word I got from him. He beautifully navigated this challenge because here's this middle-aged conservative former four-square pastor up to his neck in a bunch of hippies, many of whom had been taking dope and had been promiscuous and had been in rebellion, you know. And there's no way he was going to condone any of that behavior, but he kept the main thing the main thing. He stressed the priority. He stated the secondary. There's a difference, isn't there? He stressed the priority. He stated the secondary. The secondary, yes, drugs are wrong. The priority, you need to be born again, okay? You see how that plays out? You stress the priority. That's what Jesus did with the Samaritan woman when he was talking to her. She was a woman in sexual sin. He stressed the priority. I want you to know the Messiah so that you can live forever. He stated the secondary. You've had a lot of men in your life, but he stressed the priority, okay? Now, today, of course... Uh, we talk about, oh, a number of issues, abortion, LGBTQ, critical race theory, Marxism. Those are all issues. Should I speak prophetically on those issues? Should you speak prophetically on those issues? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure, we should. We all should. But as we do, let's keep our priorities straight, okay? What we speak should be evangelistic. It should be instructive. It should be prophetic, all three. Evangelistic, instructive, and prophetic. Let's keep our priorities straight. The specific sins people are celebrating are sins, and we should say so. But we should speak to the broader issue. The answer to sin is not just reformation from the sin itself. It's new birth. It's eternal life. And for those who have availed themselves of that new birth, then it's discipleship, taking up the cross and following him. Let's keep those priorities straight. So that's biblical priority. Secondly, biblical rationale. Okay, keeping it biblical means stick to biblical priorities. Have a biblical rationale as well for what you're saying. Biblical rationale, it's so critical now because we're not a biblical culture, right? We, we kind of were. I mean, I'm not saying the whole culture was saved, but the culture was largely influenced by the Bible. Really, it was. Um, and so the positions we held as the church were largely the positions held by the culture. Now, the culture has shifted far from a biblical worldview. So the positions that we hold are no longer shared by the culture, which is why the culture is very honestly, and I think with real sincerity in most cases, asking us, why do you go up the down staircase? I don't get you people. Why do you believe what you believe about abortion? Why do you believe about what you believe about damnation? Why won't you embrace critical race theory? Why won't you embrace same-sex marriage or transgenderism? Why? There's a rationale behind that. Can I propose a real brief three-point rationale I think you could use? Created intention, fallen nature, revelation of Scripture. Created intention, fallen nature, revelation of Scripture. Created intention. We have a creator who created us with intention. 
fallen nature, because we are an imperfect race, we have fallen from those intentions. Revelation is scripture. The Bible has held up pretty well over the centuries because it reveals to us what our creator's intentions are and how we may know him. I know that's very brief and it's very general, but really it, it's, it's a great way to kind of frame the conversation, created intention, fallen nature, and the revelation in scripture. That's a biblical rationale for the positions we hold. You notice Paul reasoned with people, reasoned with people in the synagogues, and he also looked for a chance to express truth and rationale, as in when he was in Athens. And he said, okay, let's, let's try to reason together about uh, why we all believe that there is something above the physical. I see you people are very religious. You've got monuments up to all these gods and one to the unknown God. Well, let's, let's start there. Is there a God or is there not? And if there is, how may we know him? So in that sense, observe the B of the ABCs. Keep it biblical. Keep it biblical. Explain biblical priorities and explain the biblical rationale for your positions. And finally, the C of the ABCs. There's accurate, there's biblical, and then there's compassion. Keep it compassionate. Avoid the error of speaking truth without respect. Avoid the error of speaking truth without respect. I think often there's something in the mindset of an apologist that can put such an emphasis on truth, which we must. Okay, let's not apologize for that. But in doing so, we can neglect another matter, which is very important, our compassion. We're not just brainiacs speaking truth to win a case and prove a point. God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he gave. Let's be those who love the world so much that we give, that we give of ourselves. Because it sure can, I mean, first of all, because we should, okay? We should. The love of Christ should constrain us. But secondly, tactically, it really works better. I've been on the other side of this, you know? I've, I've talked before many times about my background as a gay activist. I remember when I was at uh, uh, college in Long Beach, I was um, the head of a gay student union and did a lot of deba debating on campus and talked to many different classes about homosexuality gave my own testimony as a gay activist and talked about what it's like as an openly gay man. And I was wrong. I was completely wrong. But I spoke with a deep respect for everyone involved. I spoke to the students respectfully. And I said, I know many of you will disagree with me. I understand you have your own viewpoints. Many of them are religious. And I respect that. But I would like you to better understand what it's like to be a gay person in a straight society. I want to explain to you why I feel I was born this way and God made me this way and why it's not a sin, blah, blah, blah. I was wrong about everything. But you know what I was right about? My attitude. And then I'd get challenged, often by Christians, often by just people who hated gays, really. Um, and they were right in their position but lousy in their attitude. You know what? I won. I didn't win because I was right. I won because I had the right attitude, not the right position. You know, it's sort of like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. If, if I'm saying all these things, speaking prophecies and saying all sorts of wonderful, mysterious things under the anointing, um, but I don't have love, it's clang, clang, clang. It's just not going to play. It's not going to play. Now, I do know you may be accused of clang, clang, clang when you're not clanging at all. Because I know that today we are often accused of being hateful when we're only being truthful. That's right. I, I know. And if somebody is telling you you're hateful and bigoted and everything you're saying is just a big clang, that doesn't necessarily mean that's true. My gosh, in John 6, uh, verse 66, Jesus had been speaking basic truths about intimacy with him and about what it meant to be in union with him and to do the, the need to, if you're really going to follow him and know him, you'll eat his flesh, you'll drink his blood. And it's when a lot of his disciples walked away and never came back. So that's going to happen. And yeah, people are going to deliberately misinterpret you. Sometimes what you say is just going to be too much for them. Other times they're going to want to come against you because they hate your message. So he said, Matthew 5, 11, blessed are you. When men shall speak all manner of evil against you falsely. They'll speak all manner of evil against you falsely. That will happen. And that is not your fault. And that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. But I guess the warning we ought to take to heart is let's examine ourselves first, okay? If people are going to say we're hateful and bigoted and so forth, let's make sure that they have to lie in order to say it. We want to check our words and our attitude. So said Peter, 1 Peter 2, 12. 
when he said, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, among the non-believers, really, say, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know? Let them have to ultimately admit that they were wrong just by looking at the kind of life you live. You are living with integrity. Paul said something similar to the Philippians, Philippians 1.28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Don't freak out when people are canceling. You don't flip out when people are saying, oh my gosh, you're horrible. You need to shut up, et cetera, et cetera. In nothing be terrified by your adversaries. See, this is nothing new, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. It's an evident token of their perdition. That means when you are speaking truth and you get that howling, unreasonable, hateful response, that's an evident token of their perdition. You did the right thing. You said what you needed to say. No matter how hateful their response is in its own way, it is evidence that you said the right thing and it is evidence that you're in the right position. And sometimes that's what we're here for. We're here to invite and to indict. We're here to invite. Oh, come on. Anybody who will, please come. We want you to be born again. And if you have been born again, we want you to follow him like a faithful disciple until he comes or you die. Either way, we want that invitation going to everyone. We're here to invite, but we're also here to indict. Not deliberately, not like, okay, here I am to tell you the truth, so you're going to stand in judgment for it. But the fact is, yes, that's part of our job description. We need to be speaking truth no matter how much hostility we experience when we speak it. Because part of our job description is to fulfill a commission of justice. It is just that people not be able to stand before God and say, well, I didn't know. Nobody warned me. No. Well, we we are part of that warning. We're here to invite and to indict. We hope for the first. Man, I want to invite more than I want to indict. But we accept the second. And that is the reality of life as stewards of truth. I want to be a better steward of truth. I hope you do too. That's one of the reasons we put this podcast together. If you haven't yet subscribed to it, would you hit the bell there? Let me know you subscribed. I'd like to thank you personally. Anything you wish we were talking about on this podcast, I'd love to hear your suggestions, your comments, your feedback. Also, if you have not yet picked up a copy of the book this podcast is based on, just came out last year. It's called Christians in the Council Culture by Joe Dallas, available on Amazon.com. That's written to equip the average believer to speak on the hot button issues, abortion, transgender, homosexuality, racism, progressive Christianity. It's kind of a handbook for, okay, I want to have these conversations. What do I say? What do I not say? And how do I say it? Pick up a copy of that. And also, if you'd like to support this ministry so we can go on providing free content, just go to joedallas.com slash giving joedallas.com slash giving. That'll show you how you can partner with us. Love to have you on board with us, you know. Well, this is Christians in the Council Culture. We're here every Friday. I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Meanwhile, let's keep in mind what Paul said to Timothy about our job description. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, if perhaps God will grant them repentance according to to the knowledge of the truth. That's 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. That's pretty good advice. Let's keep it in mind, okay? When it comes to the truth, it is not just where you stand. It is also how you stand. Hey, thanks for being here. God bless.